This week on show 66 of the audio podcast, Olympic Sonic Roar, we talk about OS X Lion and why you don't want to use it yet with your audio stuff. We talk about hardware that might work, hardware that won't work, software that might work, software that won't work, and there's lots of tenuous links to the Olympic Games. All this week on the audio podcast. Roar! This is the uh, 30th of July. This is the audio podcast. It's episode 66, Olympic Sonic Roar. I'm Scott Hewitt, and this... Fantastic. I don't know if you've said I can come in, but you've completely frozen just as you were introducing me. I am Adam Yanch. I'm in for Sam Freeman this week. Um, Yeah, should be good. I died, Adam. You, yeah, you did. So I was carrying the show there. That's uh, That was actually quite scary in a way, but no, it's fine. So uh, yes, uh, I, I don't know if anyone out there heard anything that Scott said or anything that I said, but uh, uh, I'm Adam Yanch and I'm in for Sam Freeman this week uh, as kind of uh, in the in the wings presenters. I'm a kind of in-between normal presenter and guest presenter status this week. Ooh! Ooh, check me out. So, uh, so... In, uh, in London, which obviously is a big deal if you're into sports or other things. Um, it is a big deal, isn't it? I guess it only happens every now and again, and it's happening right now, so that's kind of cool. It does happen every four years, in fact. I think that's the schedule for the Olympic Games. Is, is that the schedule, though? That's very exciting. Yes. Um, it, it's an interesting title because, of course, you've got the Olympics, you've got Sonic, so that kind of links to one of our uh, items later on, and also with the audio podcast. And then there's the word raw, and that brings out uh, an interesting sensation in me because I know one of the big pieces of news from the last week, and so does Scott. Um, and that is that Apple have released MacOS 10.8, Mountain Lion. Nice reward there, Adam. So uh, Mountain Lion has been released. Uh, Art Stetniker did a, a massive review. It's huge, isn't it? It's like pages and pages and pages long. Yes, um, when, uh, when Apple release a, a big feature update, a point something update, Ars Technica get John Syracuse in to give them a huge, huge review. Uh, the review is 24 pages long, uh, and it delves, you know, it, it covers all the kind of really obvious stuff, but then it goes deep down into like the programming side uh, of of 10.8 and really kind of gets to the nitty gritty. So uh, I would recommend you read it. I have read it myself. Uh, you probably don't have to read all of it, but um, it's incredibly enlightening. You get to really get the idea of where Mountain Lion is and how it's moved on from Lion. But the Indeed. most important thing for us is audio. audio support. Audio support. So, Scott, I mean, what's the deal with audio support with 10.8? Well, I've, I've, done a, I've done a big kind of roundup, which I, I well... I deliberately left until as late as possible today to do, and then one of my cats actually brought me a live mouse and le- deposited it in my living room, so I spent a That's substantial nice. amount of time chasing a live mouse around my house today. But um, So it, it's not as complete as I hoped it would be, but I still think it's pretty good. Um, this, is the, this was the situation as of the 30th of July, 1855, BST. Um, okay. so that was about 15 minutes ago. About 15 minutes ago, so obviously things will change over the course of the week. I think the first thing, just to link up to the Arts Technica, is they did point out that you usually get a, a minor revision within 20 days of the major revision happening. So the fact that 10.8.1 would generally turn up in the next 20 to 30 days. And in many ways, I, I suspect that most people would probably generally be advised just to wait for that to happen before kind of stepping up to 10.8. But then um, I think in, in our discipline in audio, in audio and music, it's really advisable to wait even longer. You know, wait till maybe point 
10.8.3 before you upgrade. There are problems with some devices. Uh, there seem to be problems with U uh, USB 3, although those are actually to do with drivers and not necessarily the operating system. Yeah, I, I, there are problems on the on the last version of 10.7. I think if my if my memory serves me correctly, we're going to talk about USB 3 in a couple of minutes. In a couple of yes, minutes later on down in the show, we've got a post on that later. So um, so, so let, let's go first of all. Motu, who always seem to be the first to the punch, always report that their hardware is is fine and works works well. We have um, a track record for that, so yeah, you know, we can I, basically assume that's true. That's true, yeah. We uh, we do joke about this, don't we? Because with 10.7, they basically announced the same thing, and it worked fine, and it took some other manufacturers a couple of months to get to that point again. So I, I don't know if it's just because they build, uh, you know, Motu drivers are just that solid, or if they're really disciplined at building to the to the letter of the spec rather than the spirit of the specs. I don't know, but... For whatever reason, Motu are reporting that all is well. I'd be inclined to believe it. At the same point, I'm. I, I think it's still worth holding out for a minor revision, probably before risi you know risking your production environment on. Well, yes, but the, on, on the, the ten point eight. Is it's not just Motu. You're not just going to be using Motu unless you're using Digital Performer as well. And even then, that's different from the hardware. So your software and your hardware uh, will be ten point eight compatible at different times most likely and before you make the upgrade because of the way that you upgrade it uh, make sure you have a 10.7 burnt disk because you might not be able to download the old version um, yeah. there are or if you're on 10.6 a 10.6 backup as well depending yes, on where you're, where you're moving up true. from so make sure that you have a burnt CD or a USB stick copy of the older system that you can go back to if you decide to go ahead. Uh, that's just like really obvious. But I tend to wait at least six months. I'm, you know, there's nothing wrong with Lion for me at the I'm, moment. And I I'm actually running 10.6 and perfectly happy at 10.6. So. Well, yeah, I'm my music computer's on 10.6 as well because it actually can't be upgraded to 10.7. So. Poor thing. Oh, uh, so computer. what other what what are the other statuses with the other companies? What uh, we've got Focusrite. Uh, they haven't said anything yet, but it seems that their stuff seems to work okay. Yeah, I, I think Focusrite are basically are, are taking the stance that we're going to say it doesn't work, but if but nobody's actually told us that their thing doesn't work. Now that could be a success of them telling people. That could be a success in terms people people are just not upgrading because the support isn't there and have, hence they're not getting any problems. Or it could be that people are upgrading and everything's working fine. So that's always the classic scenario, isn't it? I think when you're in this kind of situation, is really getting a feel for what's actually going on with your, you know, w yes. with your user base about the people installing or not. I mean, if the audio audio people, I think, are used to maybe not not being cutting edge and upgrading straight away. Um, native Instruments, we're kind of talking about Native Instruments later with USB 3, so maybe should we bubble that all together later on? Well, we can do. We can summarize it. They have the certain, prop certain products have problems. Okay. There you go. That's a good summary. And uh, with uh, the Avid products, Sibelius 7 is completely compatible, but then that's more of a, that's not really deep down audio. Uh, but as usual, Pro Tools isn't supported yet, and that's no surprise. Pro Tools takes time to they take time to certify the systems, so we can't be saying, "Oh, they haven't got Pro Tools ready for the new operating system update," because you know we're used to it. It's fine. Ten point seven will do for now. Well, we 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 are used to it. At the same point, it does always intrigue me the fact that Avid are never ready for the upgrade, because well, you you I would think. That the, the problem is that, I mean, can you put all your eggs in one basket? I think Motu are ahead of the curve in that respect. But I think Avid really do want to make sure that their products work with the actual release candidate final version of the thing and have it work properly and test it a lot before they say that it's uh, supported. You never know. You could try it and it could work flawlessly. You know, that's happened with previous versions of Pro Tools. It's just that Avid don't want to say that it's supported yet. 
Mm. But, you know, that's fine. I mean, no problems with that. Uh, Steinberg, uh, well, this with the new with the new gatekeeper feature. Yeah, the, but there's still a couple of little uh, little bits about Avid there I just want to quickly mention. Um, Pro Tools 9 um, and all of the earlier versions of Pro Tools are unsupported and will never be supported on Lion. So that that's the end of the road for for Pro Tools 9 users, it's time to do the upgrade. Um, and that's not actually, Pro Tools X hasn't been out that long, has it actually? So there's going to be a couple of people, probably people in that position. It's been, a, it's been around a while, it's been around at least a year, hasn't it? Well, okay, maybe a year, but I'm just, you know, that's, uh, you know, there you go. And this thing, you know, I buy laptops and run them for four or five years, so, you know. Well, yeah, but then if, you, if you've got Pro Tools 9 running and you have 10.7, then you can just keep using that. Content. You just keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how about this as a bizarre oddity though? Apparently, Pro Tools SE 8.0.3 with patch 003 will work. Ah, I see. So we we would need a Pro Tools whiz to be able to identify to us why that was there, you know. Ah, well, maybe uh, Alex Harker can tell us that for a future episode. That's uh, <laughs> that's hold on. So that's Pro Tools SE. So that's like the old version. What's SE? I remember LE and I remember Empowered. What's SE? I to to be honest, I just thought it was such a little kind of morsel of a tidbit. I thought it was fun to to, to copy it across. I to put it in. You know, our you our listeners can Google it as fast as we could, so we're just allow them to Google away. Let's yeah, see. we'll we'll move on. Uh, Steinberg problems with the gatekeeper feature in ten point eight. Uh, and they're not. Is like oh, I can see that being a problem for some audio people, uh, audio manu uh, software developers, because of the way it works. Uh, but I think in this release it shouldn't be too difficult. But there is a workaround. Yep. So I detailed this. Um, Steinberg aren't offering any support for hardware, so they're basically you know don't go there yet in the hardware world. Um, so Gatekeeper is one of the new features of 10.8, which is basically a security enhancement, which basically says that you can't install it, it forces restrictions on where you can install software until you tell the machine to ignore those restrictions um, th this is actually this actually solves a real problem because this will this successfully handles the issues of people recompiling software and putting dodgy things inside of it you know kind of like malware and worms and kind of things like that it's also a nice feature in terms of any piracy as well because um, you know, something which has been pirated will probably have its signature changed as well, so it wouldn't install correctly. Um, th these kind of things. Um, the big issue, though, is basically the fact that software that was released before 10.8 will need to be updated to work successfully with the Gatekeeper security system. So at the moment, the workaround is just disable the security system, which you do, well, we detailed it quickly on the website, but system preferences, security and pr privacy, general, allow applications downloaded from, and then the, there's a variety of options there, but if you select anywhere, then you can download anything and then install it as you wish to. Yes, and the whole idea is that it's supposed to move people towards the Mac App Store, but not close the door for developers who are, whose software can't be distributed that way or developers who don't want to distribute their software that way. Um, and the default setting allows a certain uh, exception to do with developers having a kind of certificate to say that to Apple say that this is okay yeah that we're okay as developers and you can download our software so it's a kind of halfway house mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see how this gatekeeper feature is evolved in future versions of the operating system but that's for a future time now let's get back to the present and what's the big thing that's happening uh, in the next couple of weeks Scott the very biggest thing. The very biggest thing. Are you, are you talking apart about from, the... Apart from the audio podcast, of course. Oh, of, of course, yes. Are, are you talking about the Telefican Mix Olympics, Adam? Ah, well, uh, I was actually just talking about the Olympics in general, and I was going to then link it in, you see. You like, uh -huh. you like the way I was kind of going? But yes, uh, the, I, I was talking about the, the, the Olympics, and there's a very interesting audio-flavoured Olympics competition being run by Telefunken. Yeah. So um, it, it's basically a well, it's basically a mix. These mix this multi track down, and you win a prize. Um, however, in this case, it's a M80 either in gold, chrome, or bronze finish, representing the 
tiers of victory available. And these are um, microphones, of course. Yes, so yes, they're, they're microphones, yeah. Hey, you can get the, uh, the details about the contest and the multi tracks online. We've linked to them from uh, the audio podcast.co.uk. Uh, this is show 66. Um, the, uh, the, the, the hand in day for that competition is near the end of August, so have a look at the details. Uh, and it's a kind of remix based thing, and yeah, there are three different choices. All of the audio samples, all of the audio files have been recorded using Telefunken microphones. That's the, yeah. the whole link with the whole thing. Uh, and cool. so, yeah, you have to have your remixes in near the end of August, but click on the link at uh, the audio podcast.co.uk and you can get more information and while we have many uh, international visitors to the UK at the moment who are more than welcome we also have uh, online visitors as well uh, Yuli uh, Berenger is uh, visiting the Sound on Sound forum on the 3rd of August to uh, answer questions about the new Behringer X32 digital desk yes I had a look at this desk on the, the Behringer page actually I was going to have a look at the Sound on Sound Review, which I think is in the latest edition, yeah. Edition, but I, I downloaded it onto my iPad and then I completely forgot to read it. So, uh, but it looks like an interesting desk. It's around two thousand uh, pounds digital desk, but it's got some technology because they uh, Behringer took over Midas. Midas, yep, that's and right. Yeah. Some Midas technology in there. Um, lots of. Uh, interesting functionality, lots of ins and outs. It's, it looks like a pretty flexible desk, but of course, the person to ask these questions to, if you have any, is Yuli from Behringer. So, so that's cool. The, the Behringer X32, and we mentioned its uh, US tour last week, um, and I think maybe the week before we actually mentioned its arrival in shop sort of stuff. But it, it, it's almost like, in my mind, it looks like a kind of LS9 competitor or something like that. Um, you know, a, a digital desk designed primarily for live use, plenty of I/O on, on on the back of it as well, which is you know kind of well, really use it in a nice I, space. The one thing I noticed when I was looking at the product page is it says it has 16 XLR outputs, and that's not all of the outputs; those are just XLR outputs. And I thought, wow, that's that's a lot for a digital desk to have. And when you look at the back panel, it really is just a row of input XLRs and a row of output XLRs. So it looks like it'll be pretty well specced for what it is. You won't have to buy lots of cards like you do with the Yamaha desks to get all the inputs and outputs. But the, the issue there is the live or the studio focus because if you, like a, an LS9 32 desk has comes with 16 outs on it, 16 XLR outs on it as well. So it, it, it's the live focus on the, on the Behringer desk and Behringer are always very good at bringing exceptional value for money with you know many if people would say to live with the quality of it which is you know obviously the Behringer products are not top 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 quality but what you get back is value for money and you know Perhaps. I, I know you have experience of some be other Behringer products um, I, I did have an old Behringer desk a while ago but I haven't really had any of their any of their products uh, what have been your feelings about the the well, quality I've I've had quite a few bits to be honest, and while you know y yes there is an issue you know there are issues of quality at times and I but to be honest I think a lot of those issues have kind of fallen to the wayside now. Um, their their gear I found if it's well looked after seems to run in death you know runs in the same sort of lifespan as you'd expect anything else to it just it keeps on going it's looked after, um, and the, the main thing is they do offer. The value for money thing is exceptional. I'm saying, I, I think back maybe five, six years ago, where you could, you know, if if you were in a, a kind of what I'll what I'll say a dirty live environment. Now, what I mean by that is, you know, it's that kind of acoustically compromised sort of place. You know, you're in a bar which isn't really a bar, which which isn't set up for live sound. You're just dragging and rig and setting it up really quick and all that sort of stuff. And in those kind of situations, you know, Behringer have always supplied excellent value for money on outboard gear, which sounds good enough. You know. It, you're never going to make it sound awesome, but there are times when you know having eight gates in a in a one U rack is you know for for a hundred quid that's that will solve a whole load of problems well enough. Whereas you know I mean you could spend a thousand pounds building that up with a whole load of other people have a massive box which weighs a ton and the quality still won't be that much better. So 
I've always argued there's a place for their kit. Now, what interests me about this desk, though, is that when you consider with the Midas acquisition now being made in there as well, so there's going to be Midas technology in there, and then in the digital domain, it's, you know, into the converter, do the conversion, and then from there onwards, it's really hard to differentiate what you're actually going to do because you're essentially just manipulating numbers and, you know, everybody's going to make an amplitude representation slightly louder and exactly the same in a very similar way, you know what I mean? There's no, this whole kind of analog circuitry magic and things like that is just kind of gone from that sort of domain and I think that's where the kind of criticism of Behringer products were perhaps leveled in the past was just that, you know, you could always use a lower quality solder or a lower quality resistor or, you know, that kind of stuff and I don't think that transfers into the digital domain in the same kind of way perhaps. So the Midas acquisition you, you feel as maybe more towards the hardware and particularly the, the inputs and outputs, the ADCs and the DACs, that kind yeah. of thing. I mean, well, I, I, think it'll be, so. I think it'll be a, a, an interesting product because it's not like you get 2,000 pound large channel digital desks released every week. So let's see how that goes on. Uh, we're going to have to backpedal a bit here and, and actually talk about the Olympics again. Back pedal, back pedal, da, da, da. Yeah, so um, Mashable had a really great interview with Dennis Baxter, who is one of the BBC Olympic production people, and he was discussing um, the use of audio in, in the Olympic Games. Um, the, the Mashable article cites a BBC documentary called The Sound of Sport from 2011, which I've referenced, which I've, I've cited ourselves and referenced back to. But it was very interesting to hear him talk about the fact that they actually develop the audio the audio that you hear isn't just pure live audio. They actually mix in other elements and they manipulate the source to achieve various different things as well. So in, in the aquatic center, sometimes you'll be listening to a hydrophone. Other times you'll be listening to just a normal kind of ambient mic. And other times they are combine the two together to have particular effects and that kind of thing. And it's very interesting to read about it because, to be honest, even though I'm active in the audio domain and I do a lot of production work and things, I'd never in a million years thought about the fact that, well, I'd never thought about what you hear, to be honest. I'd just been like, well, that's the, you know, that's what it sounds like, maybe. So. Yeah. Well, kind of cool. you're only going to question what you hear in that kind of domain, listening to a, a live sports event, if the sound is is weird and not as you would think it would sound if you were actually in the place. Hmm. But you know, sound design. I mean, how far do they go with the sound design? particularly for the Olympics? I think they, they, they definitely mix in other elements, and it's definitely a kind of priority to them in terms of reinforcing the spectacle of the whole, the whole kind of event. So it was, yeah, it, it, it's a very, it's a detailed interview from Mashable, and the BBC documentary is, as you would expect, is, is very well produced and very interesting and has comparative elements inside it as well. So it's, you know, it's definitely, it's definitely worth checking out. I would recommend... I'd recommend looking at those two things if you're interested in that kind of space. Excellent. So, as always, you can go to the audiopodcast.co.uk, show 66, and find the links to the Mashable article and to uh, the, an, a, a web page about the documentary, The Sound of Sport. Uh, the documentary it says it was 2011, so I guess that's probably not available now on iPlayer or anything. So that's a shame. Uh, right, so... Moving on, and you know what's continuing, Scott? You know what's continuing? It's, what's continuing? It's IK Multimedia Savings Bonanza. <laughs> is, this, is it the summer of savings? Is that what it's called or something like that? I, I, I think it has actually an even better name than that, but yes, it, it continues. Um, all, all the way through the summer, IK Multimedia are offering different promotion or different kind of bundles and promotions at the moment. Until the August the 8th, they're offering 60% off Ampeg SVX and the Amplitude Fender. Fantastic, fantastic. Indeed. So we can hope maybe for some more savings on some other products later in the summer, but at the moment it's Ampeg SVX and Amplitude Fender by IK Multimedia with big savings. Yep. Available as standalones or VST, AU, RTA, yes. 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 Great. So uh, moving back to native instruments, um, and now we're going to talk about the USB side of things, the USB problems that have been happening on new Macs with USB 3. 
in particular there's a little update from native instruments about what's going on what's working what's not working and um, that kind of thing yeah it's, it's quite a, a a decent little list and it, it particularly says that there are some items that are affected by problems with usb 3 drivers yeah um, and this is 10.4.7 and 10.8 so it's not really related to the mountain line uh, thing so uh, no, the problems. So, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go the, ahead. The, these problems were identified under 10.7, and we first mentioned it in show 61. Well, we're on show 66. Well, that was a long time ago, um, and they're they're still kind of they're still sort of ongoing. Um, I had a very quick look, and I don't think there've been any. No, there, there were, hadn't been any update because I checked it again. So they're, they're still having USB 3 problems here now. Um, I I actually kind of went out on a little bit of a limb in the bottom of our post that I put up last week because um, I've kind of I'm in my mind I think there is actually an issue with the OSX support here as well because well, what I'm thinking is that um, the USB 3 machines which came in just recently came in under 10.7 all, but all immediately qualified for upgrades to 10.8 didn't they? Uh yes, yeah. there was there was a promotion for that, but I don't know exactly when the dates were. But I imagine that those new computers were covered. Yeah, so I I kind of wondered if what happened was that Apple with the USB three support stuff, Apple had to maybe you had to roll something back or had to kind of put, quickly put together support for ten point seven when they got to the situation where it was clear that they were going to roll out the USB three machines before they rolled out ten point eight because you could see how it would be a nice kind of line in the sand to say, right, if you're on USB 3, you're on 10.8, and just, you know, to move forward like that. So I, I kind of wondered if the issue with you, the issue with 10.7 for USB 3 is perhaps the fix for that is actually going to be moved to 10.8, and that will be the, rec that will be the recognized fix. Because are people really, how much time is going to be invested by people into supporting the old operating system now? Because... Well, no, Apple are going to move forward and it'll be security issues. If there are security issues with the old version, then they might do some kind of update depending on how severe the problem is. But yes, I suppose what you say is probably correct there. And, and seeing as the new machines now will have 10.8 on them anyway, and nearly anyone would prob nearly everyone would have updated their brand new Macs to 10.8 when it came out I could see that being the the solution mm -hmm. so uh, basically head to uh, you can head to the audiopodcast.co.uk website to find out the list um, but the list is also on the native instruments website as well so you can get a good idea of what are these uh, is this hardware this is hardware yeah. isn't it uh, what hardware is problematic uh, on new USB 3 Macs and what uh, hardware is working okay. Yeah. And uh, with that, we come to the end of the news. The and news. although there isn't an other section in the notes, I would just like to put a little brief other thing in and uh, say thank you very much for putting the start music back on the audio podcast. I noticed it on one of the old, you, you don't hear it here on the uh, YouTube feed, but if you pick up the, the podcast through iTunes, the, the post-producted one, um, the, the old school, the audio podcast music performed by Hilo PG is, uh, is played again, and it's great to hear. I think it's fantastic. Thank you, Scott. That's, well, what do you think about the little intros as well? Do you like the intros? I think that's a good idea as well. I think that's a very good idea. And when I when I listened back to it, because it was an episode I was on, I was like, I can't remember us doing that at the beginning, and we actually didn't do it at the beginning. It was uh, something we did afterwards. But um, it's part yeah, of our time travel adventures. I think it's uh, I think it's a good uh, a good thing to have intro intro music, and then we get into the the nub of the show. Anyway, so that's my little other thing. Yay for audio podcast intro music. And now we go into plunder. Which is a kind of raw pirate raw kind that's of That's pirate raw there. So um, uh, oh, designing... There's a spelling mistake there. There's a spelling mistake. Anyway, we'll oh. deal with that later. 
So uh, Design Sound have a, a great interview with uh, Gary Taylor of Sony um, discussing loudness in games and um, his work with the Audio Standards Working Group. I, I thought it was a cool interview. Maybe it could have been news, but I decided it was more plunder, so it became plunder. Well, it's on because we were talking about this in advertising, were we? Or was it yes. that me like, reading something and thinking I'd been on the audio podcast in it? No, no, uh, we, 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 we've talked about uh, loud, the loudness wars many times on the show. And that's part of the ongoing. Um, know, but what this is, it. is, it's not necessarily about the loudness wars, making things louder. It's about different games having different maximum levels and you having to change the volume on your television because different games are mastered to different levels. And the chap in this, Gary Taylor, is basically saying, right, it's time that we have a standard. And because broadcasts are getting the finger out and actually sorting something out, RE adverts uh, on TV and hmm. um, TV programs and the difference of loudness there. Let's do the same in games and it's a good idea um, to, to do that and to make sure that the experience people have is a good one. I think it's also worth noting that the PS3 and obviously the Xbox 360 and other sort of devices are, are very much viewed as kind of home entertainment, home media centers now as well. So. I've, I've had the experience myself where you've been playing a game and then you go put a movie in and you've got to change the volume of you know the TV set um, having done that and it's, it's about making the whole experience kind of cohesive and kind of linked I think which is a good Actually, idea. I, that reminds me I, I, I was trying to think back and I was thinking oh, I've had this same problem before and yes it was with my PS2 and computer games and DVDs played back. The DVDs were much louder, so I had to turn them down, but the games were then much quieter, so I had to turn them up. So I say, very good idea. Let's let's make this. Let's do this. Okay, so that's loudness in video games and Sony trying to pioneer something. Um, the next item I had a, a brief look at, but I didn't really... It didn't really come into my mind, so I'm going to let Scott... Uh, well... Um, I, I kind of, yeah, it's here, it's a bit tongue-in-cheek really. Uh, TC Helicon have announced what they're referring to as Craig's Corner, um, which essentially is a, you can ask a question of Craig and he will answer it. Um, and while I think the idea is obviously that you would ask them something related to a product um, or for some technique or something like that, he kind of suggests that he'll ask, answer anything that you ask him. Um, I, yeah, I, you know, I described it as so, social media-esque gesture which, um, you know, I probably stand by it. You understand why these things get done. They're kind of fun, but yeah. Yeah, to try and take the uh, hard corporate sheen off a, off a company and try and make it kind of warm and bubbly inside or something like that. Yeah, That's a cynical view. That's a cynical view. I'm sorry. That's fair enough. Um, we've talked about Pro Tools already. If you're in the Pro Tools camp and you're wondering what Reaper's like or you're in the Reaper camp thinking, oh, I wonder what Pro Tools is like. Um, ProTooler blog has a, uh, an, has a comparison article between the two of them. I'm going to have to stop you right there, Scott, because I read this and it's not a comparison article at all. It's basically the, the writer, who's a, he's a, a long-standing Pro Tools user, but he's also been doing, he, does, he also does tutorials for Pro Tools and tutorials for Reaper. It's basically him saying, these are a bunch of things that Reaper has that are awesome, and Pro Tools doesn't have and should have. That's what this article is. It's not a comparison, and it's not really... I don't think it's fair to call it Reaper versus Pro Tools. It's, it's a different kind of article, I think. And, uh, I mean, yes, granted, a lot of the points that he... the things that he points out, in particular things like uh, offline bouncing, offline rendering, which, I mean, I... I kind of, I thought Pro Tools did that, I really did, but uh, uh, now I think actually, I've never actually really made the effort to know whether that's true or not, because um, I'd always just do it the way I did it. Uh, things like that, yes, Pro Tools could definitely benefit from, and there are certain things that Reaper does very well that Pro Tools doesn't do well, but the article is unbalanced because it doesn't say, it doesn't list Pro Tools strengths and the things that Reaper doesn't have that Pro Tools does have, which is kind of unfair. 
I think. But th that's my take on that article. That's my take on it. Uh, do you have a, a feeling about it? No, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with your editorial criticism there, Adam. That's fine, you know. Don't worry about that. I mean, it's, it's fine, really. I mean, I've tried, I tried Reaper, and I really want to like Reaper. It's such a lovely idea, but I just found it so incredibly fiddly. And, and like, to get it to work the way I want to work is just too much of a hassle when I know that the thing that I that I want to use works the way I know how it works and all this kind of thing. So um, uh, maybe in the future I'll come back to it, but uh, I've just found it to be a very fussy place to work and and I've struggled with it in that sense. But uh, but still, I, I'd rate it above logic. I have Ooh. logic history. And uh, let's move on to our last plunder item and it's actually a really nice item uh, an interview with Charles Watkins who is the inventor of the Watkins copycat tape delay effects unit and that can be found on nam.org but it's a, it's a video interview so we get uh, he actually kind of explains uh, why he came up with it with the idea of the, the Watkins copycat and he even has like the the prototype in his house and uh, he, he brings it out or he gets his wife to bring it out for him and it's like yeah this is the prototype um, yeah it's, it's a nice uh, it's a nice video uh, I mean you you put that in Scott so I guess you have a kind of reason for um, uh, you might have another reason for putting that in no no I am I are the the not present Sam Freeman actually did that oh okay and did you did you see it? Did you watch it? I have I I didn't actually have opportunity to go and grab it. We um ah, as as as, as listeners to, as listeners to the show will have realised that we we have a system where if you put an item in the in the if you put an item in the notes you're responsible for knowing why it's there. So, I uh, uh, no, knowing that uh, I was taking Sam's place today, I decided to bulk up and read most of the articles. Um, I never usually do that. I usually allow Sam and Scott to to introduce them, and I'll just come in with uh, snide remarks on things. Awesome stuff! Awesome stuff. Well, we've made it to the end of the uh, end of the plunder as well, Whee! Which, which means we've made it to the end of this week's audio podcast. Oh. oh, it's okay though because the audio podcast will return most likely next week, Monday. The something of August, 7 p.m. Uh, of course, you can catch up with the audio podcast from the website, theaudiopodcast.co.uk. You can have a look at all the links from this episode, past episodes. You can go and download the podcast or see it on YouTube. That's fantastic. And uh, also, you can catch the audio podcast on Twitter. Um, the handle is the audio podcast. Awesome stuff. Cool. Well, this has been show number 66, Olympic Sonic Roar of the Roar. Audio Podcast, uh, the 30th of July, 2012. I've been Scott Hewitt. And I have been and will continue to be Adam Yanch. Thank you. Awesome stuff.